Can you tell us how you got interested in social work and psychology? Happily. Um, I am a hybrid uh, in terms of my career between social work and psychology, and there are backgrounds for both. So when I was an undergraduate uh, at Harvard, then I took a course on learning theory, and it captured my attention. And I majored in social relations, which was the psych version for uh, human beings. Uh, and then realized that I needed to seek a career at the time that I was a senior in college. And also was well aware that my mother had been a social worker early in her career. Uh, and she had worked on adoptions. And I thought, well, that's a field or a social work in general that I'd be interested in. So I, I think that what I did was combine my father's intense work ethic work ethic with my mother's interests and decided to try a, an MSW program. So I went to Bryn Mawr uh, to get that. And the, while I was there, I had an opportunity in my clinical training to follow a clinical psychologist around who visited families in their homes. He did parent training. And uh, that was genuinely interesting and I particularly enjoyed not being sitting in an office while I was trying to provide some intervention for people that would work. So that led me, I, I got a job in a family, uh, uh, family counseling program and ended up feeling very quickly that I didn't really know what I was doing. My training was mainly psychodynamic and it wasn't adequate to the kinds of people I was seeing. So what I went, did was go to find lectures on the topic that were more from the learning theory base and behavioral treatments. And I found those over at the behavior therapy unit, which was Joe Wolpe's clinic and research center at that point. That was at Temple University. So after attending some of those, I ended up deciding that it was time for me to get some serious clinical training in this field and one of my early supervisors was Alan Goldstein, uh, very helpful to me. Joe Wolpe was a, a very important presence in the clinic. Uh, and I gradually transitioned to working with Edna Foa, who is a, a formal mentor for me. Uh, I worked with Edna for many, many years. Um, and ultimately, I ended up taking a one-year position with them to provide treatment to clinic patients I began working with Edna on research grants. We got a grant, I then got employed on that grant. And uh, that led, the work with Edna led me to be involved in treating OCD because she was finishing up a trial. I treated a patient on that trial who was uh, absolutely fascinating and got very much better in the course of the treatment that we were delivering, which was exposure and response prevention. So that absolutely shaped my career and also led me to realize as I worked with this research group that I needed to go back and get my PhD while I was at it. So I continued my work and then went back to Bryn Mawr to also pick up a PhD in social work, which is the degree that I have now. You've touched a little bit on this already, but who were the most important influences on your career? I would certainly say that behavior therapy unit and the many, many people I met there uh, working on the grants. There were many people coming through for shorter and longer stints in training on behavior therapy. It was an outstanding training experience. And uh, the people were phenomenally smart and committed to behavioral treatment, which was the primary focus at that point. We're in the middle 70s here, uh, late 70s and early 80s. So the kind of people that I met and uh, know to this day are people like Jackie Persons, Diane Chambliss was a student when I was uh, going through it in her doctoral program. Uh, Rich McNally is another one, Alec Pollard, John Grayson, uh, Mike Kozak, many, many more people there. And then uh, as I made a decision to apply for faculty positions, I applied to Boston University and moved in uh, the middle 80s to take a job there as an assistant professor. 
and poked around looking for people who worked on OCD in the area. I was going to be teaching in a school of social work. That's not so disorder specific, so I needed to find my colleagues in the area. And as I did so, I found a, a, a doctor named Karen White, uh, who, with whom I wrote my first book, a self-help book for OCD. That was a, a wonderful experience. He was a, a fine colleague to do that with. And then I uh, began to think more seriously because my dissertation had been in an area, uh, area about family factors associated with OCD treatment outcomes. And uh, my early knowledge of work with Diane Chambliss led the two of us to put our heads together and to write a treatment grant that would evaluate the role of family factors in treatment outcome. We got federal funding for that from NIMH uh, we worked on both agoraphobia and panic, which was her area, my area on OCD as well. So uh, that has had a, a major influence. Diane has been a fabulous colleague to work with. And then in that early 80s period, before I made the move, I had met Randy Frost at an ABCT conference in 1982. We both remember meeting. We didn't really start working together until I had moved to Boston uh, in 86 or 87, we started working together. And so that led to, now it's a 30 plus career period in which we have been close collaborators, first in OCD and then uh, more recently in hoarding and hoarding disorder, which has taken off as an area of study. So that's had a, a major influence on my career. And we've worked with a host of colleagues internationally around obsessive compulsive disorder and the beliefs which led us into cognitive therapy and so forth. So, so that's a, a brief foray into that. What started your interest in cognitive behavioral treatments? I would say it's that very early undergraduate course on learning theory that I had and then that MSW training period where I worked with a clinical psychologist on the family aspects. And of course, by far, it was the behavior therapy unit and Joe Wolpe and that clinical training in which I felt I got some of the best clinical training that could possibly be available. I really saw many, many patients with great supervision on a weekly basis and just got very good at it. And you know, it, it, that's certainly what led to it. And watching patients get better quickly was a, a wonderful experience. So, of course, that cemented my focus on it. What are your most important contributions to research or practice? It's a good question, and I think, you know, some others would probably have opinions that matter more than mine about this. I think that the things I'm proudest of are work that I did with Edna Foa on exposure and response prevention and understanding the mechanisms by which that treatment worked so well. Uh, those have stood the test of time uh, and I think are some of our more highly cited works and she certainly built the groundwork for all of that work. Um, I took a, an interesting but brief side trip into post-traumatic stress disorder, again working initially with Edna on it little bit more work that I did uh, when I moved to Boston, um, but other people have carried that field much further uh, than I have done. It's a very complicated condition and one that um, is very much deserving of the many, many fine researchers in that area. So um, other contributions that I share with Diane Chambliss, and I would say that she's a prominent driver of the work on the family aspects of treatment, when to include family members, family accommodation and its impact. I, I worked with Barbara Van Noppen on some of that work. Um, and the role that family can play as a critical aspect of cognitive and behavioral treatments, both in implementing the CBT work uh, and in supporting patients as they go through it. So that's been uh, an important piece that I've enjoyed the work on. I have to say that the work on hoarding disorder with Randy Frost 
has probably made more of an impact for, um, from my perspective, in terms of really helping patients figure out people with hoarding and learning to work in a much broader context than strictly clinical mental health treatment because hoarding absolutely requires it. Another piece that I would say I'm pretty proud of is that uh, my work with the colleagues from uh, around the, the world on beliefs in OCD was very helpful in finding uh, consensus about what were the belief aspects, the cognitive aspects of OCD that were relevant and how we might target those. And I worked with Sabina Wilhelm very closely in grants that we got on OCD and then later on body dysmorphic disorder. So, you know, what's been fun is the variability in the conditions we've worked on. They've all been OCD and anxiety based, um, OC spectrum disorders, and the truly fine colleagues that I've uh, had the privilege of working for. How do you think we can do a better job of disseminating CBT to clinicians? I frankly think that we probably need to think more like marketers and probably engage the field of marketing and advertising in how we do this. Because dissemination is a, a big issue for us. Uh, we are still in a country full of mental health clinicians, social workers certainly, uh, psychologists as well, that um, are not using CBT or not as well trained in CBT and therefore access to the treatment by the patients who need it is much harder to come by than it should be. So I would uh, love to see us target and train more people on this, but I think we really want to help the public understand what they are entitled to treatment-wise that is legitimate and appropriate for their problem, and then to demand that it be available to them so that we can build on that demand so that clinicians feel that they really must deliver the best possible treatment uh, that is appropriate for that person. What do you believe are the biggest challenges facing clinical science? That's a good question. And I would say that um, the dissemination problem is one of the biggest ones that you, we've already noted. Um, I think staying relevant in a digital age and figuring out how to use our technology in the most efficient and effective way possible. So if we're going to market, how are we going to market? What is the best mechanism for building the demand in the field. Um, I think we're having a lot of trouble now that I would love to see us get beyond in terms of funding for psychosocial treatments because we still need to do a lot of investigation of what works best and for whom and under what conditions. That's, I understand that's expensive, but um, an exclusive focus on biology will be problematic for us. On the other hand, we absolutely need to take advantage of new knowledge in neuroscience and biology in particular, genetics, etc., to figure out how to move this work forward. Again, on behalf of people who need the help. What recent findings about psychopathology and mental health are likely to have the greatest impact on future research and practice? I will say that if I, I had it to do over again, I would get better trained in neuroscience and in clinical, um, I'm sorry, cognitive science in particular. We have a ways to go. We, don't, we still don't know how to use the brain information we've got, um, but our future lies in these areas. And then we have to figure out how to translate that onto a behavioral and practical level that people can use. There are a number of intervention strategies coming out that use this kind of cognitive and neuroscience understanding 
to uh, advance ways of sort of retraining how we do things and how we think about things and how we feel about those things. So I'd love to see us do that. I think we've also, uh, we're in the middle of a process of trying to understand when diagnostic categorizing works for us and when it doesn't. So there are transdiagnostic strategies that people are uh, beginning to uh, develop and develop in a treatment strategy. Dave Barlow has put some of these forward. Uh, I think we have a ways to go in order to advance that so that the lumping and splitting that we all do as human beings uh, in terms of our, how we think about things is used to best advantage. What changes would you want to see in graduate teaching and training? I'm going to speak to this from the MSW aspect, that is social work training. It turns out that social workers do provide, uh, it is the profession that provides the most mental health services in the country at this time. Now that's not true for some other countries. Uh, so if I think about how to do that, then one of the important pieces as an educator in social work is for us to understand how best to utilize the structures that exist within social work. So we have the Council on Social Work Education, which accredits all MSW programs in the country. There is a commitment in social work to evidence-based practices, but I don't always see that translated well enough into the actual practical teaching content. And I would like to see the accrediting body get a bit more strict about that uh, in terms of what they expect and what the product is on the other end in terms of how well trained people are clinically. Social workers get a lot of clinical training in the field, but moving cognitive and behavioral treatments and other closely related evidence-based practices into that field work is a, a critically important area. You learn it best when you train on individual clients and groups of people that need the treatment. And so we have to find a way to get that out there. How do you see CBT evolving in the next 10 years? I would say a lot more focus on the technology and on getting treatments out in the public, into the public, through a variety of practical strategies for doing so. So for example, we've got um, my close colleague Jordana Muroff has developed webcam treatment for people with hoarding in the home. Hoarding happens in the home. It's where the treatment needs to be. So how do we move that out so many people can access treatment with clinicians, well-trained clinicians, in their home setting when that is the right place to do it? If it's not in the home, but outside of the home, fine. How do we get that across? I think we also need to figure out how to get our reimbursable treatments across state lines. So as we work so hard to train clinicians to do effective treatments, then we want them to be accessible to a broad range of people. And right now in this country, of course, we have some pretty arbitrary mechanisms by which we license clinicians and so forth. They're all state by state. So I'd love to see us move that out, and that's technology that's gonna enable us to do it. And the other thing that I think is probably an issue here, um, I see it particularly in our work on hoarding. We've also seen it in OCD and OC spectrum conditions. Context matters. Using family members matters. I'd hate to see us stick with our clinical treatment that's in an office that is convenient for a clinician, but not so convenient for our client and not so relevant for the client's problem. So that's, those are areas I'd like to see us move forward in. Um, I also think that we want to pay super close attention to what's going on among our international partners. So Britain has figured out how to um, really disseminate CBT broadly and effectively. Uh, they're reaching many more people. They're doing a much better job of training clinicians, so they are more skilled in these areas. I think we have a lot to learn.
And finally, how has membership in ABCT impacted your career? This is absolutely clearly my professional home, and I know many of us have probably said that. Um, I think my first ABCT was in, we were guessing the other day that it was uh, 1977 or so, is probably the first time I attended, possibly 78, I don't actually remember. That's a long time ago, we're 40 years uh, post at this point. And I can't overstate the impact that ABCT has had in terms of introducing me to the colleagues with whom I've worked very closely over many, many years. The level of the scientific investigation that ABCT promotes is at the top of our field. And we come here to get rejuvenated, to talk to each other. I have long-standing friends who were colleagues uh, we all were awed by the um, massive intellect of our forebears, if you will, uh, who uh, were past presidents and past luminaries in the field. So uh, nearly all of my close research colleagues have all come from ABCT. It has made my professional career. I think that's clear. Dr. Stephanie, thank you so much for your time. You're most welcome.